June 19 is a significant date. On that day in 1870, the Selma Catholic Church was formally dedicated by Bishop John Quinlan. Other important historic events also occurred on June 19. In 1862, slavery was abolished, and in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was adopted. If we go back to the year 325, we discover the Nicene Creed was formally adopted also on June 19. That ancient creed states that we believe that we are one holy Catholic and apostolic church. On June 19, 1854, the founder of the Edmundite Fathers and Brothers died. The Edmundite founder wanted the marks of the church to be the attributes of his religious community. The 150th anniversary of the dedication of the Selma Church also coincides with the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Among the historic items possessed by the Selma Parish is a Civil War rendering of the Sacred Heart. The scripture readings for the feast this year remind us of the foundations of on which the past generations of faith and the legacy they left us as a result of their persistent faith, enduring hope, and untiring love brought forth over the years. May the message of the scripture readings for the feast dispose us to recall the past and celebrate the present. Deuteronomy emphasizes God's abiding love. John's letter speaks of the Lord's love for us, and Matthew recalls the Lord's invitation to the weary and the burdened. Next year on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, Hosea will tell us God will never give us up, and God will never give up on us because God's heart is overwhelmed and God's pity for us is always stirred. Paul will remind us in his letter to the Ephesians that knowing Christ's love is better than all knowledge, and John's Gospel will invite us to look on him whom they have pierced so that we might know the love and life that froze from Jesus. The small group of Catholics at Selma, prior to 1850, were very much aware of being one holy Catholic and apostolic church. As apostles were sent to spread the gospel in the early church, missionary priests from Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, and later New Orleans, Louisiana, and finally Mobile, Alabama, came to Selma more or less regularly so that area Catholics might feel part of the Universal Church. Bishop Michael Portier placed the Catholics of Selma under the care of St. Peter Parish in Montgomery in 1850. Sacramental records prior to 1862 are stored there. Father John J. O'Leary newly arrived from Ireland, was appointed the first resident pastor of Selma in 1862. He saw the need for a permanent church to be built following the Civil War. A memorial in the church reads, Sacred to the memory of Reverend John J. O'Leary, late pastor and rector of this church. The deceased was born in 1838 in County Cork, Ireland was ordained May 3, 1867, and died April 1, 1875, in Mobile, where his ashes mingle with those of the deceased clergy of the diocese. Father O'Leary was revered and beloved for a gentle and willing, winning spirit and simplicity of manners, for a tender and generous compassion for the poor, and for a cheerful and innocent playfulness or disposition whichever concomitant of true piety. This monument is erected by his friend and admirer, Reverend J.C. Crowley, aided and assisted by the grateful people of Selma to record his virtues and to perpetuate his memory. With a resident pastor of Selma, Sacramental records for the parish begin in 1862. 
Joseph Leon Herman was the first recorded baptism. The oldest records of the parish have been digitally scanned to better safeguard their valuable information. Long before paved roads and interstate highways, railroads and riverboats made long distance travel possible. Five different railroads radiated from Selma. The railroads made it possible for missionaries to come initially to Selma from Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, and Mobile. In the 1860s, Selma's five railroads provided the means for the Selma pastor to cover a wide mission territory to evangelize and to administer the sacraments. The decision to build a Catholic church in Selma came as the first Vatican Council was meeting in Rome. Vatican I emphasized the importance of faith and the authority of the church, especially that of the Pope. In, the eight, in 1960, the Second Vatican Council would engage the world and Selma at another critical moment in history. With Father O'Leary from County Cork, Ireland, it should not surprise anyone to learn that construction of the Selma Church began on St. Patrick's Day, 1869. After the Civil War, many former Union soldiers, like Captain Henry Cochran, who served as Selma's postmaster for many years, settled with other Union soldiers in Dallas County. He and former Union soldiers joined with former Confederate soldiers like Captain Richard English, who became editor of the Selma's Times. Working together, they used stones from the old Confederate arsenal to erect the church. The stones of a war, which deeply div divided people, became the stones that turned the swords of war into plowshares of peace. The church was originally named to honor the Assumption of Mary. On Sunday, June 19, 1870, Bishop John Quinlan dedicated the completed church. From the exact records kept by Father O'Leary, the church cost $13,084.43. The architect was A. Von Fisch Fischers, who received a fee of $100 for his plans. Originally, a statue of the Sacred Heart stood over the main altar with a large crucifix hung higher in the church. While today the pastor in Selma serves Catholics 15 miles away in Orville at Immaculate Conception Church, many will find it hard to believe that in the 1880s, Catholics 135 miles away in Anniston were served from Selma. Mary Louisa Burke's baptism on October 3rd, 1885 was the first baptism recorded in the register for Calhoun County. This early register uses Latin rather than English. This reg register is now preserved in the archives of the Archdiocese of Mobile. Besides being responsible for missions in Calhoun County to the north, the Selma pastor also had pastoral care of Grow Hill in Clark County to the south and Demopolis in Marengo County to the west. Selma's mission field was 320 miles long and 50 to 70 miles wide. About 450 Catholics were scattered throughout the mission. Nevertheless, a Catholic Women's Altar Society was founded, and several young Selma Catholics entered the convent or became priests. The Society of Jesus from Spring Hill, Alabama, took over the pastoral care of the parish in 1880. Jesuit fathers and brothers based in Selma served at one time or another 14 counties. The counties were Autauga, Bibb, Calhoun, Kacha, Clark, Clay, Dallas, Escambia, Hale, 
Marengo, St. Clair, Shelby, Talladega, and Wilcox. As educators, the Jesuits instilled in those they served their values of excellence, justice, respect, and much more, all for the greater honor and glory of God. A vestment of the Jesuits used in those days hangs in the blue room of St. Andrew's Hall. The annual report to the bishop in 1884 helps us appreciate that the Jesuit fathers and brothers knew the baptized they served. The 1884 report indicates that there were 250 Catholics in Selma and 200 more Catholics scattered throughout the mission stations. The report shows not only how many Catholic men, women, and children were in each locale, but also how many practiced their faith and how many did not. For example, the Jesuits would go all the way to Anniston to serve a total of 22 Catholics, with about half faithfully practicing their faith. The report also mentions be beholding to the ladies of the Sacred Heart and outside sources for support and help with a debt of $5,600. Globally, the Universal Church responded to the challenges of the times with Catholic social teachings in Reno Navarro. The Universal Church expressed concern for child labor, long hours, and poor working conditions for laborers. Nationally, black Catholics gathered under the leadership of Daniel Rudd for the first black Catholic Congress. Five national congresses were held between 1889 and 1894. Daniel Rudd recognized that the Catholic Church alone could break the color line. Rudd argued, our people should help the church do it. While there are 218 churches in Dallas County today, with 28 in Selma alone, few have diverse congregations like Queen of Peace. The parish demonstrates what determined Catholics can do to reflect one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. The 1890 census of mission sites lists Mrs. General Burke in Jacksonville, Alabama. She may be the Maria Louisa Burke shown as the first baptism in 1885. The annual report for 1891 indicates that four colored were among the 262 Selma parishioners. The ladies of the Sacred Heart taught 50 students, 36 girls, and 14 boys. Including names of the individuals in the report suggests that the Jesuits were very much in touch with Catholics in the missions, despite the distance from Selma and the frequency of visitation. A Jesuit journal describes what visiting a mission entailed. The article recounts going to Minter, Camden, Cole Bluff, Nellie, Bells, and Wainwright. Here's an excerpt from that Jesuit journal. Some of the mission stations could be more conveniently reached by steamer on the Alabama River, but that would depend on the water stage of the river. If too high or too low, our landings would be difficult to make for a passage. So we will make this trip as best we can. In Selma, at Selma we buy our ticket for Minter on the Allen and Flomaton branch. Postcards have been sent in good time to all stations so that they will be looking for us. We reach Minter and look around for Dr. Boykin's team that will take us 10 miles to his home down near Portland. The team is not in sight. Still, I am sure that Dr. Boykin sent for me. I make inquiries and find that the team was there, but had left for home. I find a Negro with mule and wagon 
who is going in my direction. Our pace is slow. Why hurry? The day is long. Far away down the bend, my driver sees the doctor's team hurrying back. There are two Catholic families here in Minter, very refined people of Canadian stock. They come to Mass and Communion whenever the priest visits them. The Salva Parish was noted for its devotion to Christian education. In 1880, the first Jesuit pastor, Father René Hallen, invited a French order of nuns, the Madames of the Sacred Heart, to set up a school for girls on Broad Street, where the Trust Bank, Trustmark Bank, is now located. The next pastor, Father John Shanahan, bought the old Masonic Hall in Cahaba in 1883 and used its columns and materials to erect St. Andrew's Academy to serve as a high school for boys. The Sisters of Mercy took over the girls' school in 1891 and began 80 years of service. The Sisters of Mercy offered the values of compassion, respect, integrity, justice, hope, and joy, as inspired by Mother Catherine Macaulay, the founder of their religious congregation. In October 1918, more than 2,000 cases of influenza occurred at World War I Camp Sheridan outside Montgomery, and more than 12,000 cases occurred within the city of Montgomery itself. Alabama Governor Henderson at the time closed schools, churches, theaters, and picture shows. The 1918 pandemic lasted 15 months from spring 1918 to early summer 1919. It infested 500 million people, about a third of the world's population at the time. Jesuit Father Henry Stagg wrote to Bishop Allen on November 8, 1918. His letter includes this. The ban on public assembly in the city of Selma was lifted Thursday at 7 a.m. I opened the church Thursday morning and had mass at 7 o'clock. This is the first time the church was open to the public since October 7th. Father Stagg also asked Bishop Allen to exempt him from attending a diocesan conference and offering a written paper because, quote, it would be next to impossible to write theological papers and not neglect the missions. I have 40 stations to attend to. I am away most of the time, some months having only five or six days at home. And the work is increasing. Father Stagg ends his letter by saying, I bought a baptismal font for the church in Demopolis. It is paid for, cost $52. Commending myself to your Lordship's holy sacrifices and prayers, I am your Lordship's humble servant in Christ, L. H. Stagg, S. J. The parish death registry records five deaths in 1918 and nine deaths in 1919. The youngest deaths were 16-day-old George James Troha and three-year-old Joseph John Hewer. While the causes of death were often given as pneumonia, consumption, or tuberculosis, 98-year-old James McDonald's passing was attributed to old age. It was interesting to discover the civil unrest and riots over race coincided with the pandemic. The National Catholic Welfare Conference was founded in 1919, and in 1966, this organization 
was reconstituted into the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the United States Catholic Conference. In 1922, the Alabama Baptist Convention opened two new hospitals in Selma. The Alabama Baptist Hospital on River Avenue received white patients. Black patients were taken to the former home of Dennis H. S. Sullivan, which served as Good Samaritan Hospital on Boglin Avenue. Pope Pius XI was elected in 1922. He inspired Catholic action, established the Feast of Christ the King, published an encyclical on social justice in the modern world, and requested U.S. religious congregations to send missionaries to serve the colored population in the Deep South. Taking attention to the fact that Talking Pictures began in 1924, and it was the year that the U.S. sought to limit immigration, it is interesting that the immigration issue is with us today as we face the pandemic of 2019 and 2020. In October 1929, Wall Street crashed. It was in this year that Mahatma Gandhi began a civil disobedience protest in India and initiated a non-violent response to injustice. Gandhi maintained it's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time, that there'll be any fruit. But that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action. But if you do nothing, there will be no result. Gandhi inspired Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and planted the seeds whose fruits endowed future generations with hope. Pastoral care of the parish reverted, reverted to the diocesan clergy in 1931. Father Francis McCormick, the pastor, discovered that the church was in serious disrepair and he carried out major renovations. In January 1937, Bishop Thomas Tulin invited the Edmundite fathers and brothers to establish a mission among the colored population in Selma. In July, Edmundite fathers Francis Casey and John Perro arrived in Selma and began the Edmundite missions. They converted a former bar room and bordello into a combination rectory and chapel. On April 3rd, 1938, Bishop Tulin dedicated St. Elizabeth's Chapel, which began serving a handful of black Catholics. In 1938, a flood devastated Selma. Muddy floodwaters spread over thousands upon thousands of acres of fertile farmland, causing substantial loss of crops. Rescue boats sought out more than 44,500 homeless. Forces were mobilized for emergency aid and permanent rehabilitation of Alabama's flood-devastated thousands. Convoys of small boats and trucks carried food to nearly 3,000 persons driven from their homes by the swollen waters of the Alabama and Cahaba rivers. A letter from Edmundite Father Francis Casey to Bishop Tulin describes the role St. Elizabeth's Chapel play. The Sunday after you were here, Bishop, 
we did not have our chapel. The preparations in view of the predicted 60-foot flood crest was the reason. The mayor asked for places to house Negroes, and I offered him the church. He told me that he was not going to ask for churches until the last thing, but that he did have a special use in mind for ours if he could have it. The next day, he asked for the church to be turned into an emergency hospital for the colored. We had it stripped out, clean, foam, cots, and mattresses in. We didn't have to use it, and I hope we'll have the church all ready for Easter. I'm not sorry we did it. It was an excellent thing as it turned out. It is broadened down, according to the mayor, much appreciation. No one, he said, believed you would strip the church, especially for the colored. As soon as it was known, we had plenty of offers to take care of the Negroes. As nearly as I can find out, this is the first time the town has publicly declared they would house and hospitalize Negroes. So that's something. I have avoided publicity as much as possible and will continue to. The facts behind the thing are that many of our, quote, friends are scared to death of what those, quote, Catholics will do next. And even a gesture on our part starts them to action and the Negro gets the benefit. The opposition is really roaring now, especially among the colored preachers. We have lost a couple of catechumens that I know of, but that's to be expected. And we'll pick up some of them again. The baptismal register for St. Elizabeth reflects that many Negroes were becoming Roman Catholics. Four of the initial six baptisms are shown as, quote, conditional, because the individual was previously baptized in another Christian denomination. Matilda McCreer, the last surviving slave captured in Africa in the 19th century, died in Selma in January 1940. With her mother, Grace, and her sister, Sally, Matilda had been bought by a wealthy plantation owner called Memorable Prayer. Matilda, Grace, and Sally tried to escape the plantation soon after they arrived, but they were recaptured. The abolition of slavery in 1865 brought emancipation, but Matilda's family still worked the land, trapped in poverty as sharecroppers. Even though Matilda left West Africa when she was a toddler, she appeared throughout her life to have worn her hair in a traditional Yoruba style, a style presumably taught to her by her mother. Matilda's grandson is none other than Johnny Creer. He was born in the same house where his grandmother Matilda died. Conversions to at, by the Church of African Americans came very, very slowly until the Sisters of St. Joseph arrived from Rochester, New York. Their teachers made possible St. Elizabeth's School on Church Street. The Sisters of St. Joseph also provided their nurses, and this made possible Good Samaritan Hospital, and later its School of Practical Nursing. The sisters looked to John Creer to be the lay administrator of Good Sam. Matilda's descendant would also play a prominent role in the Selma Chamber of Commerce. Good Samaritan Hospital played a critical role in providing health care to the poor. 
The Sisters provided not only health care for physical bodies, but also spiritual care for hungering souls. Premature babies were reverently baptized and prayed over. The first person baptized at Good Sam was Walter Palmer, whose parents lived in Autogaville. The entry shows Sister Anne Patricia baptized the infant before he died. Besides the arrival of the Sisters of St. Joseph from Rochester, New York in 1940, Craig Air Force Base opened as a pilot training facility that year. According to records, Craig Air Force Base had a population of 5,000 people, and at one point in its history was one of the busiest airports in the United States. Craig had an annual payroll of more than $30 million and spent more than $3 million in services from local businesses each year. People in Selma say the impact of closing the base is still felt today. Father Vincent Coyne established St. Elizabeth's first youth club when he set up the Savings Athletic Club in 1942. The club withered away after Father Coyne had to leave for military service. Father Nelson Zeider, however, launched in 1947 the Don Bosco Clubs, which had a dynamic impact on black youth in Selma for the next 19 years. The Bosco Clubs provided recreational facilities at a time when most schools and churches did not provide them. Moreover, they encouraged black youth to go on for further education. As a result of Bosco, many Selma youth attended college. The two-story brick wing for Good Samaritan Hospital was completed in 1947, and its School of Practical Nursing opened as the only school of its sort in Alabama that was open to black students. In 1948, President Harry Truman ordered the integration of the armed forces. This meant that black pilots would ultimately be trained at Craig Air Force Base in Selma. Realizing it was in 1850 that Selma Catholics were placed under the pastoral care of St. Peter's Parish in Montgomery, parishioners at Assumption Church celebrated their centennial. 1950, was also the year that Pope Pius XII solemnly defined the dogma of the Assumption of Mary, and the parish built a new school at 2511 Summerfield Road to replace the old Sacred Heart Academy on Broad Street. In May 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered an end to school segregation, and in December the first computer which was known as UNIVAC, was produced. In March 1957, the U.S. enacted a civil rights, rights law, the first since 1870, to aid blacks in obtaining voting rights. Two black Selma natives were ordained Edmundite priests. James Robinson was ordained in 1957, and Moses Anderson, was ordained in 1958. It was also in 1958 that Pope John XXIII was elected Pope. He convoked the Second Vatican Council to renew the Church. In 1959, Union Railway Station closed, leaving Selma without the passenger service it had enjoyed since the 1840s. Civil Rights sit-ins began in the South in 1960. In 1962, Selma lost its professional baseball team when the major leagues would no longer work with farm teams that did not accept black players. Although Selma's Cloverleafs were willing to make the adjustment, the Montgomery team was not, and as a result, the whole Southeastern League went out of existence. 
In August 1963, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led a large civil rights demonstration in Washington, and in September, following racial riots in Birmingham, federal troops were used to achieve integration of the University of Alabama. Among the documents issued at the close of the Second Vatican Council was one called Gaudium Espes. This document described the church in the modern world. The document begins with these words, the joys and the hopes, the sorrows and the anxieties of this age, especially those who are poor and in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the sorrows and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Sergeant J. O. o. Burke, a white member of Assumption Parish, was beaten up in 1964 for publicly defending the parish's policy of allowing blacks to attend services. In July, the U.S. Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act and in August, it established a comprehensive anti-poverty program. Nevertheless, in the summer, racial riots occurred in northern cities. On March 7, 1965, Alabama State Troopers violently broke up a civil rights march in Selma. On March 15, Referring to the events of Selma, President Lyndon B. Johnson called for a new Voting Rights Act that was enacted on August the 6th. Watts riots occurred in August, and riots in other U.S. cities followed. Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. led a successful civil rights march from Selma to Montgomery under the protection of federal troops beginning on March 20th and concluding on March 25th. Father Morris Ouellette, pastor of St. Elizabeth, was a leading supporter of voting rights, and so many of his parishioners were arrested during the demonstrations. As a result, St. Elizabeth was dubbed a parish of jailbirds, by the weekly newspaper, The National Catholic Reporter. The Voting Rights Act was finally enacted after a long filibuster in the Senate on August the 6th, 1965. After leaving Selma, Father Ouellette directed the initial formation of those entering the Society of St. Edmund. Edmundites is currently serving in Selma received their novitiate training under Father Willett's tutelage. In 1969, Pope Paul VI promulgated the reform of the Roman Missal and revised the rights for marriage and for baptism. In October, John L. L. May became Bishop of Mobile. The Diocese of Birmingham was created and Joseph Fath became its first bishop. 1971, Bishop John L. May amalgamated Assumption Parish and St. Elizabeth Parish to become Our Lady Queen of Peace Parish. It was Bishop May's hope that the new parish might be a sign of reconciliation for the city. Sadly, some white parishioners and some black parishioners left the Catholic Church, but those who remained have witnessed one holy Catholic and apostolic church in doing so. The faithful demonstrated that there can be unity in diversity. In 1971, parishioner Edmore Moss approached the all-white city council 
with a request that the city change its method of electing 10 council members at large. In 1972, the Selma Accords were drawn up between representatives of both races. The Accords promised black neighborhoods, full city services, and that black people would have a fair share of city jobs. Funeral director Randall Miller was appointed director of urban renewal. And in 1976, Ed Moss became the first black to be elected to the Chamber of Commerce's board of directors. While Craig School closed in 1976 and Craig Air Force Base closed in 1977, Black Catholics were assuming greater roles and more prominence in Selma. Good Samaritan Hospital Administrator Johnny Creer was elected to the Chamber of Commerce's Board of Directors in 1979. And Selma native Father, Morris, Father Moses Anderson was consecrated to serve as Auxiliary Bishop of Detroit in 1982. Today, Corey Bowie serves as president of the city council, and Johnny LaShore is one of the city council members. Corey Bowie also is Grand Knight of the well-integrated Selma Council of the Knights of Columbus. Maria Stevenson serves as president of the well-integrated Women's Society of the Parish. Queen of Peace Parish was the first parish in the diocese to set up parish-based social ministry. Sister Maureen Finn, a sister of St. Joseph, was the first director. Other sisters from other congregations worked in concert to serve needs and minister to those both of the parish and of other churches. In 1990, the Sisters of St. Joseph celebrated their 50th year of service. As lay ministries developed throughout the Catholic Church, the Edmundite Mission Corps was established and based in Selma. The lay volunteers were welcomed as part of a worshiping congregation, and several parish families provided a home away from home as host families. In addition to the Edmundite Mission Corps, numerous volunteer groups come to Selma to learn and to be of service. Lasting impressions have often been imprinted, and some have actively sought to be ongoing partners in ministry. Members of the parish began working closely with the Edmundite Center of Hope in 2010. Parishioners annually help prepare and distribute Thanksgiving dinner, donate clothing and supplies, and contribute financially to the center's operation. In 2011, the Alabama legislature banned undocumented aliens from schools. The impact of the Selma on the Selma Parish was truly significant. Of the 24 people baptized in 2011, 23 were Hispanic. Many of the Hispanic families immediately had to leave Alabama so that their children would not be denied an education. The 50th anniversary of Bloodiest Sunday occurred in 2015. In recent years, the former St. Elizabeth's Church has served as the parish daily mass chapel. In addition to the annual speaker's luncheon on MLK weekend, a bilingual mass is followed by a diversity luncheon with the ethnic and cultural heritage of parishioners being celebrated on Pentecost. On Pentecost, the cultural heritage of each parishioner 
is celebrated with their favorite recipe. As the parish celebrates its 150th anniversary year, it is mindful of the many generations of faith upon which it is built and the significant sacrifices and overwhelming challenges it faced along the way. We look back, conscious of the great endowment bestowed upon us by so many in the past and in so many different ways. We look to the future in hope that our efforts will sustain the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that we've come to know as Our Lady Queen of Peace Parish in Selma, Alabama. We end our presentation on the 150th anniversary of Our Lady Queen of Peace Parish in Selma with the mission statement of the Edmundites that serve the parish currently. It is our role to invite all of you to be an integral part of the church and her mission. Your participation is vital to the church and to that mission. Your gifts and your talents, whatever they are, they're needed to build that mission. And we call you from being a stranger and an alien to be a full partner in the ministry of the church. May God bless and keep you, and may Our Lady Queen of Peace defend us always and intercede for us with her Son, our Lord Jesus Christ.